57 yards. Whoa. Who is this kid? Lester. Guys, uh, today's going to be a fun one. Uh, all you goal getters out there, um, and I've spoken uh, to it a few times, but I really want to speak on it today, and and that the, is the importance of, of having a coach. You know, I've had a coach, I've had a mentor starting at, at age four years old all the way up through 10 years in pros. Um, I, built, I built a strong brand in the fitness and, and motivational space during my career, um, but I never had a coach for it. You know, I did over 50 speaking engagements per year for four years, you know, elementary schools, boys club, all the way up to Fortune 500 and, and ending up in the White House. And, and I'm trying out all these different things because after playing in, in the pros and being coached and seeing how capable I could be when the best in the world is working with me allowed me to to take what was, you know, stock potential and actually make it a realized gain, you know, having a pro career and, and financially blessing my family. But our guest today um, is one of the greatest uh, coaches and he coaches nearly every single um, entrepreneur that I have. But I, I really, before we introduce him and, and, and let him bless you guys the same way that he's blessed me, I really want to kind of paint the picture for where I was at before um, Craig Ballantyne and I met. But, um, you know, I was hosting shows and I was doing fitness and, and creating motivational content and trying all types of different hats on, you know, being an entrepreneur or, um, you know, being a, a TV show analyst or, you know, football. And I decided that being an entrepreneur was really my next challenge. And so I retired after 10 years in the NFL, walking away from seven figure salary to take a chance on myself. And this is the exact moment when I met Craig Ballantyne and, um, you know, having a coach as as an entrepreneur has been such a blessing in my life because you know if you want to become the best at what you're doing in life go out and find the best people uh, to give you the life habits the routines the mindsets the ability to overcome uh, adversity and move nimble through uh, the different to-do lists that are going to get you to your ultimate goal you know Craig Ballantyne is the coach to coaches he's a coach to entrepreneurs pro athletes high achievers global influencers he's an author of a soon-to-be best-selling book called Unstoppable, How to Get Through um, get through Hell, Overcome Anxiety, and Dominate in Business and in Life. And I've actually had a copy of it uh, about 40 days before it came out. And, um, and another thing that Craig and I share, in a, you know, aside from his involvement and in being instrumental and in really setting me up for success um, as an entrepreneur, is he's somebody who struggled with anxiety and depression as I have, and Craig has some amazing tools that he's going to share with us today uh, to help manage that. Uh, but, but before I let Craig speak, I just want to tell Craig I'm thankful, man. Dude, I, I really appreciate the influence that you've had on me as an entrepreneur, which has really enabled me to level up the way that I show up for my wife, the way I show up for my kids, and the way I'm able to show up to my relationships and my friends because you helped me gain a stronger relationship with time and when you have a strong relationship with time you you are the master of how you use it um, so I'm not a master yet but you've really implemented some really some awesome um, tools into my life so before I allowed you to speak and we're probably eight minutes into the podcast but I really wanted to take an opportunity and and tell you about Craig um, and how he's played an instrumental role in my life because he, you deserve more than just me reading off what's on Wikipedia or talking about the different books that you've released. Like people want to know, okay, that's great. You've had authors on and best-selling this and that, but what does he mean to you? Um, so this, this podcast is a little bit different to me because this is not just a host to have a host. This is a little bit of a tribute as well um, for your instrumental support and where I'm at today. So without further ado, nine minutes into the podcast, welcome to the Steve Weatherford Show, and welcome to the show, Craig Ballantyne, dude. This is going to be amazing. It's fun, man. All right. We just got doing some some push-ups, and yeah, I look over at Craig, I do a couple push-ups and some jumping jacks to get my heart rate up and, and bring my energy into this podcast, because uh, we're sitting in Chino Hills, California right, right. now. And I'm getting coached by Craig again over the next two days. We're at Bedros Koulian's 
in uh, Craig Ballantyne's Empire Mastermind, and I've been in this for two years, and it's played massive dividends mm -hmm. into my life. So, I mean, I'm constantly getting coached from all different avenues of my life as an entrepreneur, as, you know, a, a relationship with time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just the same way a pro athlete would go out and work with the best mobility specialist in the offseason and then the best, you know, throwing coach in the, in the offseason and go get the best massage therapist because all of those influences, you know, create the greatest athlete and – and I'm more than an athlete, so now I'm trying to be have that athletic, um, you know, supreme goal of being the best in all those different facets of my life, and that would that's what brought us together, man. So, dude, tell me, tell me what's new, man. Well, you know, the Unstoppable book is out, and as Steve mentioned, you know, this is my journey through through the anxiety hell, but coming out the other side with so many tools, so many lessons, so many exercises that people can do mentally to get rid of the clutter in their head, which is a massive cause of anxiety, and just show them a path that, you know, and hope, mm -hmm. a path and hope that there is something out there for, for you to look forward to. If you're going through it right now, trust me, there's nothing wrong with you. Everything's going to be okay, but there is going to be some work to do. But, you know, I came up with this book because it's my mission in life to help people overcome it. That's a really good, like, I, that's a trigger word for me. Hope, hope is a trigger word for me when I, because it's so overused right now. Yeah. But when anytime you're talking about depression and anxiety, like when you're having a, a day or I'm having a day, like that's really all we want is hope. And our, our brain uh, irrationalizes things to where we feel hopeless. Yeah. Um, so this being hope to people, this, a lot of your life is, is, is in this book. Mm -hmm. And I believe the greatest products are created by the people that are trying to solve a problem in their own life. How much intimacy from, from personal experience and, and really educational went into this book? Because I know there's a lot of stories and you tie yourself into it, but you're such yeah. a humble person. You don't tell so many stories about yourself. So how much of, of your journey was the inspiration for creating this? Well, it was, it was entirely my journey that inspired me to create it. But, you know, it's, it is the worst part of my life, the lowest point of my life that I talk about in that book. I don't go too deep into, like, when I was growing up or anything. But when I had the anxiety at age 29, and uh, the irony, as I do mention in the book, is that I was the fittest I ever was. I was, you know, I had the most wealth up to that point in my life. I had the most time freedom in my life. I had everything going for me. Mm -hmm. And yet I had the lowest point in my life. I mean, it's just so ironic. It's so paradoxical. Like, how could you be going through this? And it was because I had chaos in my life. Mm -hmm. Despite having success, I had no boundaries. I had no limits. I was working all the time. I was living in the big city of Toronto. And you know, in the big city of New York. And Toronto's kind of like New York. And in theory, you can go out every night. And I tested that theory. I put it to the, to the limits. And, you know, I ended up at 29 trying to live like I was 19. And you can't do that for too long. I paid the price. So I brought anxiety upon myself. Now, most people don't bring anxiety upon themselves. They have anxiety put upon them by work, by, you know, the commute, by family, all this stuff. Um, but it's at the end of the day, the solutions are the same. And so my story is in there just to show you what I went through, to show you the lowest lows that I had. Um, again, to give people hope because, hey, they can see like, man, if, he, if this guy went through that and he was able to overcome it, then, you know what, maybe there is hope for me too. And that's what I needed when I was going through it because I like to describe anxiety as a black box. You can't describe it to somebody else. You, can't, you don't know what's going on to yourself. And that's the worst. When you don't know what's going on to yourself, you're like, when is this going to end? Will this ever end? Mm -hmm. Why is this happening? Right. And those are tough questions. Even, even though I, had, I have a master's degree in exercise physiology, I knew the, I knew the physical symptoms I could pinpoint like oh this is the nervous system this is you know my heart rate is up and and these hormones must be up but I, how can I stop this I didn't know the answers to that now imagine somebody who doesn't have that background mm -hmm. it's going to be even scarier and again this is all about hey listen all these other people have gone through this there are ways out of this and let's walk you through like these 11 different tools mm -hmm. and now you've got this you know you know, a bat belt full of tools, just like Batman had all these tools, right? That you can get yourself out of any situation. So again, it's a hope there. Yeah, and 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 for me, and this, you know, you speak from your your personal journey in the book, and like, and I can only speak from my personal journey. You know, when I speak on depression or anxiety, 
and and what helps me to manage it because it's nearly impossible like if it's like a medical thing like you know yeah. you get to equip yourself with tools to help get yourself out of it because you're always going to get into these different places because that's what happens in our brain and regardless if it's like a medical condition or it's something that you create in your own brain because we all have the power within yeah. is how do you how do you manage it has become for me very very simple is I have a, a personal contract with myself and the hardest person for me to ever earn the approval from is myself. So the way you improve your opinion of yourself and have a greater relationship with yourself is by stacking promises. Ed Milet said this to me in an interview that we had is, is stacking promises to yourself. So keeping your word to yourself. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just, um, Craig and I just had an opportunity opportunity to listen to uh, Tom Belayu and he spoke to that so heavily today is like the 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 opinion that you have of yourself but also the the opinion essentially is your relationship with your identity yeah absolutely it's, I mean Tom was talking my oh book my in gosh. there because in my book I talk about how you I know how your values and vision that validated you yeah. in some way in the back because Tom is so successful yeah. and he's like he's so sharp yeah and he's so intentional that had to that had to like in your mind like when he's saying these things that I read in your yeah. book, I'm like, man, Craig's back. Well, yeah, I mean Craig's me back there feeling really good. Not that you didn't believe him, but just just to hear somebody from a completely different like planet of network of friends yeah. unsolicitedly essentially recant parts of your book. Yeah. So, you know, he, Tom talked about how, you know, the values drive a lot of, you know, his actions. And I I have this phrase in my book, your values and vision drive every decision. So that that comes down to like if you for me personally, like I want to feel like I'm 17 forever with my health. That means if that's how I want to feel for the rest of my life, then that's going to drive my daily decision of doing my stupid old man warm up that I do before every training session so that I do feel like that. Mm -hmm. And so that was one thing. And then he, also, you know, the last chapter of the book is, of my book is really important to me because it talks about getting outside of your own head and being of service to others. And that was a huge driver of Tom in his life and helping him overcome his anxiety, but also in him helping him grow that business. And so it was pretty neat to, to see us both on parallel paths that way. But man, he is, he is incredible. I have a hundred times more respect for him now than after just listening to his podcast to see him speak in person. So it's absolutely amazing. But, you know, that really is like kind of the foundation of it is, you know, they're for everybody struggling with the anxiety is that we want to make sure that we're clear in our path. We want to have a lot of the physical stuff I talk about in there as well. Breathing, yoga, meditation, all this those stuff. Those are applications, man. That 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 100% has influence. Right. And, and those are some of your quickest victories mm -hmm. in overcoming the anxiety. And then the final part of it, after you've uncluttered your mind, after you've taken care of your body, is to go out and be of service and get out of your own head. Mm -hmm. Because if you're if you're feeling anxious whether it's on a daily, day-to-day, -day, like, oh, man, it was a busy day, I'm kind of stressed out, or chronic anxiety where you have anxiety attacks where you think like you have, like I once did, had to go to the emergency room, you think you have to talk to, you know, get medical help for it. Uh, a lot of it is getting worse because we're inside of our own head. We're letting our anxiety engine rev, our mind race, our wheels spin, and we sit there and we keep all our worries inside. Man, the more you keep that inside, the more you suppress it, the greater the explosion is going to be when it all comes out. As that's what happened to me because I kept everything inside. For most of my life, I was the kind of person who didn't want to have emotional conversations. Um, you know, I never complained to anybody. I just, you know, took it all on my back. Internalized. Yeah, a lot of suffering in silence. And, mm -hmm. man, it's just like if you, if you turn the water up to 1,000 degrees and you keep the lid on, you know things are going to blow up. For sure. Yeah. And, and that's why, honestly, that's why in America, and I know it's not as bad in Canada, um, but we were a breeding ground for isolating each other. With social media, it's getting even worse. So people are communicating through the platform of the, of the digital age. There's no intimacy. Very rarely do you get to sit like we're sitting together and like, yeah. I know you don't like this. I'm a touchy person. And have somebody reach across the table and hold your hands and be able to talk to you. Like, I love that. And, and I feel like I'm like my grandpa. Well, right. back when I, back in my days, like we used to like, when we meet, we meet, you know, yeah. like in a coffee shop or at an office, like the zoom thing I've, I've encountered parts of being an entrepreneur 
that doesn't have that intimacy because I am a great leader, yeah. but I'm a great leader from a sports locker room. Mm -hmm. And it's so much different when you can't read people's body language to see how you need to show up for them. And, you know, back to kind of the topic that we were talking about was how people don't, they don't share. Mm -hmm. And you're, you know, you made the analogy of, you know, water that's a thousand degrees and putting the top on it the, the top is going to pop but that's why you see school shootings that's why you see all these different pop-ups of like i know these kids were taught wrong and it's not necessarily their fault you know like we we get to come together and and talk more yeah you know not just facetiming and the the, the digital relationships that we have i think feeds into more and more people needing this book and there's one other thing i wanted to say before i ask you a question is while you were talking, I was thinking in my mind, like how, what direction can I take this next question with Craig that would most massively benefit every single person that's listening? Because, you know, in, in their ears right now, they might be thinking, well, I don't struggle with depression or anxiety. And to me, understanding it, like you don't have to have it to equip yourself with understanding how to support it. Mm -hmm. Because I guarantee you, if you're listening to this right now, you don't struggle struggle from depression or anxiety or self-limiting beliefs or generational curses, which, A, I don't believe you. Right. But, if, but if you don't, how powerful would you be as a leader, as a friend, as a husband, as a wife, as an employee, a colleague, how powerful would you be if you learned how to connect with people that are struggling with depression or struggling with anxiety? Because my wife's had five kids, and I wouldn't say certified she struggles with depression or anxiety, but there's a thing that happens in your body when you have a kid, and your hormones right. are freaking wacky. So even if I had never struggled with it, I would want to equip myself with something like Unstoppable. And this is not me like pushing your book. I love you, dude, but this hits home to me. That's why you're on my podcast. I am, I am passionate about helping people that struggle from depression and anxiety and helping them get out of their own way to create their, their greatest life, right? Yeah. So if that's my goal, it makes total sense for me to equip these people with somebody who's equipped me. You know what I mean? So I can't give you a stronger endorsement right. than that, but understanding depression and anxiety is a powerful tool for connecting with people that have it and the numbers are coming becoming increasingly higher and higher and higher of anxiety and depression. 40 million Americans. Yeah. 40 million. So you're looking at over 10% of Americans. And and more than likely those 40 million people also have people around them that care about them. Right. How powerful would it be if they were equipped with something like this? Sure, because I'm not saying we eradicate the black it, box. but it might go from 41% globe, you know, 41% in the United States of America to 11. So now the only people that are struggling with depression and anxiety are people that actually have a chemical problem in their brain. Like that's the goal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and so, one of the things that I realized was, you know, going back to the problems that I caused myself by keeping everything inside is the day that I had my first anxiety attack, January 1st, 2006. I was hungover. It was all my fault. I had seven Red Bulls the night before, believe it or not. <laughs> and and so, oh, uh, dude, I wish I was around for some of those days. Oh my man. god! Oh my god! We could have caused depression and anxiety together. Right, <laughs> right. So there I am. I'm spending the entire day inside, alone. All these crazy thoughts going through my head. Oh my god, I'm gonna die. After 11 hours, when I didn't die, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm not really having a heart attack. But I gave up, and I'm like, I can't get rid of this feeling. So I go to the emergency room. Now here's the thing: as soon as wow, I, I didn't know this. Yeah, as soon as I walk outside on January first, two thousand six, it's a Sunday night. So oh, I mean, this is this. What age were you in? Are this twenty nine? Okay, uh, this is the story yeah. that you told in the book. Yeah, yeah. Okay, twenty nine to thirty. I this. And so, so I walk outside. It is freezing cold. It is a Sunday night. So not only is it New Year's Day when it's going to be quiet, but it's a Sunday night, so it's super quiet. And as soon as I walk outside, I feel ten percent better just by going outside. So I always tell people, like, you want to get out into your own head, but you also want to get outside physically. It'll help you calm down and, and, and overcome it's the anxiety. As soon as I get in the cab and I start talking to a cab driver, a complete stranger, I feel 20% better. So just talking, instead of, like, me inside, like, sitting and stewing and letting my mind race and all this stuff, no, I'm out, I, I at least am talking to somebody. Sometimes it's really hard to do because when you're in that spot, yeah, the last thing I want to do is like have human interaction. But it's and I got five best. kids, yeah, you know what I mean? Where I hide in the house, right? Good luck. But it's the best thing. And then I go to the emergency room, and and I walk in the emergency room, and this there's a guy my age working, and this is like the only time I ever seen the emergency room with like nobody in it. And I walk in, and the guy looks up at me, he's like, 
what do you want? What do you like that? gives me what one almost like an eye roll, right? And I walk in, and I go, I think I'm having a heart attack, and he totally changes because I, I literally did say that to the guy, and he totally changes, and he takes me right to the back. And, and so I always say to people, if you ever go to like a busy emergency room and you're like kind of pressed for time, you want to get to the back, <laughs> guy, like those are the secret <laughs> words. So those are like the, the password to the back. <sighs> anyway, so they take me to the back and the nurse, like she's rubbing my arms and stomach and everything, rubbing my shoulders. And I feel like 80% better, you know, because it's human touch and human contact and all this stuff that, yeah, we can spend three days without actually interacting with somebody if we just want to sit in front of our computers and we have enough like energy drinks and stuff in the fridge. We don't need to oh, go yeah. down to 7-Eleven. We've all been on those benders yeah, of, like, trying like, to get the work done. Yeah, and it's not good. It's not good for us. You know, we are meant, you know, we're, we evolved in these tribes and everything. And so we need to have this human contact and everything. So, so someone listening right now, like, I know that it is, you know, you might be in feel embarrassed by it you shouldn't be you know you might be intimidated by having conversations you might be like how do i get over this and it's like go be human go be human and go advice. outside be and, and talk to people and and get human touch and it'll really help bring you back down now that was that was the first time i had to deal with it and it got got worse another time we can get into that but that's just something that I want everybody to understand. And then one last thing back to the whole social media thing is, yeah, it's like there's one thing for us to isolate ourselves with it. But then at the, the same time, the irony is we're isolated among the most connection we've had to people in the, you right. know, the, the, most, the, not in the history of humans. You can't like, call it connections access. Right. Because we have access right. to right. them. Yeah. We're not connected to Right. So you have access media. to the most uh, you know, billions of people through all the social medias and every television show that's out there. So we have the greatest access to other people's lives and not just to like superficial, but deep levels of people's lives. Cause a lot of people like you and I share a lot of stuff on social media. And so we see all this stuff. And, and so, for, so first of all, your senses are overstimulated with all these things, all these options every day. I like to say, cause a lot of people are interested, you know, like they're overwhelmed by social media and they kind of feel guilty. Like I'm on it too much you actually shouldn't feel guilty because every day you wake up and there's a battle between you and 150 PhDs from MIT at Instagram. That's how many, they only have 150 engineers at Instagram, which is amazing considering how big it is, but it's you versus 150 PhDs. You're never winning that battle. They're going to get you addicted to that thing. So you can't really feel too bad about it. And you just have to come up it's with a good way of looking at it, man. I mean, because dude, I, but, but it's sometimes also, the depression and anxiety, the catalyst, is social media? Right, so I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not like a metrics Harvard study guy. Like that's that's more along the lines of why I'm friends with people like right. you. You know, you guys are metric based decision makers. But I am like hyper aware. I believe that's a gift. Yeah. I'm, I'm very aware, and like I look at social media, and it's so true. But the catalyst to me is 50 percent of depression and anxiety is caused by social media right, i don't comparing. think you can meet as many depressed um like if you meet a depressed 56 year old uh guy that's not on social media like i don't feel like that is as popular but kids like 18 19 yeah. 17 even 13 years old are like like well medicated. that's where that's where the the rise in anxiety is these days and and there's a rise it's, in anxiety at that age then there's a rise in anxiety of people a little bit older than you and I who have to take care of their parents and their kids. And there's a lot of depression in that area as well. But and that's that, not as that you don't have as much access to that. Yeah. Like I feel like on Instagram, it's like it's it's pumping comparisonitis, sure. comparisonitis. He's got this. You don't have this. And everybody's putting, you know, a figment of their imagination. On. Now, there's not to say like I don't love social media. I love social media for right. a million different I reasons. But I believe it can but be I've had greatness. to discipline myself in in what i consume because i believe what i'm what i'm looking at becomes my life so i'm very vigilant with that yeah. and the amount of time that i consume what i'm consuming how long i'm consuming it and then how much am i producing on there yeah. because i have to outweigh my production has to outweigh my consumption or i'm losing that battle i'm on there enough to see what the trends are and see you know how i I can position to land, meaning like the time that I put into producing a piece of content, I want to make sure that who it's landing with and how it's landing for them is going to be worth the amount of time that Guy and Nico and I come up with the creative for that 
the production for that, the editing of that. I mean, before people see a three minute video, my team might've spent altogether 16 hours on it and it might be 60 seconds. Huh. Yeah. Um, so it's important to be super intentional with that. And I think managing, being really mindful of how much time you're spending on social media. What was the app that just came out that tells you your screen time? Uh, you guys know? It's screen time. It's called, it's called screen, screen time. Yeah. Magically yeah. called screen time. Yeah, screen time. And I think that's it's important on Sundays that people should kind of start to monitor that. I, I just tell people, like I the other day I was tell people, like, go and delete a bunch of apps from your phone, unsubscribe from emails, and, and unfollow people. So I follow 39 people, and it's still too many people, in my opinion. Like, I want to get down to, like, under 10 people. But I'm lo I only follow people I learn from and that leave me with a positive feeling. And if I ever am following somebody and I watch something and it leaves me with a negative feeling, not that they did something negative, but just like, dude, it doesn't serve you. Yeah, what you're saying is yeah, it's not I'm, serving I'm you. I'm out. I, yeah. And and I think that we can all be a whole lot more ruthless about the number of people that we, we should follow. do that with our friends. Yeah. If your friends are not serving your best interests and supporting you, and vice versa, that yeah. you have a simpatico relationship then I think it's time to do a, a friend audit. Sure. You That's know, a really like, good way of like looking at it. look at, look at the people you're spending your time with and the people that you are allocating your time to, are you spending that time or are you investing that time? Meaning, are you getting an ROI from the time that, that is spent there? Are you nurturing the relationship? Are you building the business? Are you creating clarity in your relationship? Are you know, are, are you creating love in, in your marriage? Like those are investments. Those are return on an investment. But spending time with a with a joker that just wants to smoke a blunt and watch a movie, like to me, that that doesn't serve me. Right. You know, not that I've never smoked a blunt on the couch and watched Friday. That, that might that might serve that somebody serve once every three months, because you know, Bedros and I both have friends that have no cares in the world. He has a friend named Chanta. I have a friend named Jeremy. My friend Jeremy is an X-ray technician, and I force myself once every six weeks to spend two hours on a Saturday afternoon with him to kind of decompress, recalibrate, realize, okay, wait a minute. Okay. Get center. A, yeah. Get center. a center, get a different perspective on life and go, okay, wait a minute. Am I, am I chasing the right thing here? Okay. Maybe, oh, I see. This is right. I got to put more focus back here and get away from so this. So somebody does that for you or you do he that doesn't, for someone? He, do, he doesn't do it like consciously. Like he doesn't say, oh, we're going to sit down. It's just me spending time with him, conversation going, oh, okay. Just reminding myself how, uh, you know, quote unquote, normal people, you know, day to day, uh, day job people operate compared to like you the and I, horses. we only spend time with entrepreneurs. The, yeah, the, yeah. The, the working horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I want to spend time with them like, oh, here's what matters to them. Okay, right. I understand that. Uh, you know what? I think I can learn something from that. And, and like me working another three hours on Saturday afternoon, I don't need to do that. I can, I can go and you know, take my hobby back up or whatever it is that mm -hmm. then refuels me so that instead of working an extra three hours on a Saturday, by taking three hours off, it actually gives me 10 hours of productivity in the week ahead. And so there's stuff like that. But I love the phrase that you used before, an, uh, you know, you used a friend audit. We need to do the same thing for a diet audit because I do talk about nutrition a little bit in the book because if you're eating it's the wrong, a it's a component of right of, of right. Living if you're eating the wrong foods, I was drinking too much alcohol. I wasn't eating so much the wrong foods, but it was too much alcohol, too much caffeine, and those things mess with adrenaline in your body, which contribute to anxiety. Well, it's, a de it's a depressant and a stimulant, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. like you're you're doing too much of both. And the reason you're doing that is because you're you're having depressants, which is going to require stimulants. Right, right, you know? and, and and screwing up your sleep, and the next thing you know, like that screws up your body chemistry, and then, and you have anxiety. Or if you're having too much sugar, That's it can definitely thro th throw you off. So. So you need to audit your diet. You need to audit your environment. You need to audit your social circle. You need to audit your intake of media. And all those things, you need to audit from time to time. 100%. And, and that way, you keep yourself out of trouble, at least give you that foundation well, that allows you to, to be the best shape you can. A lot of the times, for me, for me, my overwhelm turns into anxiety, which turns into depression. Got There's it. a sequence for me. Uh -huh. I become overwhelmed. I become anxious, I become depressed. Yeah. So the the journey that I've been on and the thing I'm most excited about is it still happens, but I'm more aware to it and I'm able to essentially coach myself out of it, able to shift out of, you know, before it gets to if I notice it's anxiety, then at that point, you know, there's tools that I implore. Sure. You know, and there's audits that I will construct. And yeah. it's almost kind of like like I go to a note section of my phone and I go through the list. Got it. You know what I mean? But the two things that in influence all of it the most and you you just spoke on it was sleep 
and for me, it's routine. And it might be different for other people, sure. but the two things for me, my sleep's got to be on point. I tried to do the no days off, freaking, you know, grind uh -huh. to you, you drop. I dropped. I had like a mental breakdown and actually Bedros, my wife called Bedros one time. I don't think I've ever, sh I've never shared this publicly before, but I never, I never shared it with anybody outside of my wife and Bedros, but it was December of 2017 and I just worked relentlessly for, it was like five months straight, like no days off. When I say no days off, I'm talking about plugging 10, 12, 14 hours a day. That, was that when you launched the supplements? Yeah. Yeah, I remember you, you remember speaking that. briefly yeah. about it at the Empire. Yeah, so that. like I hinted yeah. at I, I having a really rough time, but like yeah. my wife actually, she didn't know who else to call. Huh. So she called Bedros and like, Man, well, what, do you, rock. what do you do? You know, and he showed up so powerfully for, yeah. for our family. Um, but that, it, it all went back to, I had a routine. It was grind, 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 grind. And now, you know, I understand I'm actually able to do more better with less time when I get my sleep in. Like I schedule my sleep and then schedule my routine. And then, you know, I can give myself, you know, two and a half up to three hours of self-care per day if you're getting up at 430. And then by the time I'm done with my self-care, it's like 830 and I can start my day and be done working by three um, and all that, all that really was generated by having that sit down that I had with you in San Diego, Hilton Hotel, Bayfront. I showed up for like 45 minutes late and you're like, man, this freaking guy, if he doesn't need my course, I don't know who does because Craig was so kind, um, to just essentially drop everything and, you know, see that I could, could benefit from your expertise. Yeah. And so you gave me like a full coaching day. And, um, and there was some shifts made in my life. Um, and I got real clear on my intention in addition to really looking at my relationship with time, which is, you know, has nurtured all the other facets of what I'm passionate about. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, so, you know, you were talking about doing too much and grinding and all that stuff. And so I like to use a, the analogy of, I, I pulled LeBron James up because, you know, no, they don't make LeBron James play 48 straight minutes of basketball. Right. Right. He gets halftime. He gets TV timeouts. He gets subbed out. You know, they have quarter breaks. They have all this stuff so that it becomes an amazing high performance 48 minutes, but it's not 48 minutes in a row. Mm -hmm. And so, so many people, they'll just, you know, in their day, they'll put stuff back to back to back. No rest breaks. You know, if you're taking calls for four hours in a row, you know darn well that third and fourth hour you're going to be suffering right. not enough water you got to performance you, is poor you, you, you got to pee right yeah you're like squeezing your legs together right. and you're trying not to pee your pants and it's like listen you're gonna be off your game you got to prepare properly and it's being you know respectful of time you can still get a lot done but just be respectful of time and the planning and the next thing you know you're a high performance athlete and i think everybody listening doesn't matter if you're a parent doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur doesn't matter if you're a young buck you got to look at yourself as a professional athlete with a long career ahead of them and don't go crazy at the start you know don't neglect any area of your of your performance and preparation and if you treat yourself even if you're an entrepreneur if you treat yourself like a professional athlete it's going to pay dividends yeah for sure so i've a different segue off of this conversation but i want to be respectful of your time but um i love being a dad mm -hmm. and I find a way to bring this up with every guest we have, regardless if they have kids or not, because you were a kid at one time. What was your relationship with with your dad, and what was the, the most important life lesson that you learned from your dad? Um, well, it was really good and really terrible at the same time. So my dad was, was a, you know, I grew up on a farm in Canada, and my dad was he was he was crazy like like borderline crazy but he was an alcoholic as well so it was really bad that way um but this is a kind of guy complete opposite of me like i'm very risk averse this guy when he saw a keep out sign he, that meant like oh come on in and he would like would we be on like family vacation he'd see a keep out sign and he'd climb over the fence and go somewhere like and i'd curious, be curious you think or just a rebel curious crazy rebellious I, I i couldn't explain it you know like but you know he would drive like a lunatic and we had we so grew up in canada right we had snowmobiles he would drive like a crazy lunatic on a snowmobile with me on the back and we'd flip it and like he almost had like no regard for personal safety um like he we had silos and he would climb up the outside of the silo like 80 feet in the air like with no harness on or anything and, like lean back and wave at me and and uh, you know one time he like took a chainsaw out of the face so he was like 
crazy. Did that, and I don't want to like screw screw up this flow at all, but I just want to ask a real quick question. Do you think the fact that your dad was like such um, a risk junkie, which kind of reminds me of myself, do you think that influenced you kind of maybe leaning over towards the side of of risk adverse? I don't think so. I think because I think from the youngest age that I didn't like it. And I think that my mom is very risk averse. So I think I just naturally, I think if there's genetics for it, I think. Because I'm curious if it's nature or nurture. Yeah. Because my so, son seems to be, um, I don't want to say lacking self-confidence, but risk averse. Yeah. And I'm, dude, I'm 36. I'm still jumping off of my house into the pool. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I, I, I don't know. But continue your story. Anyways, yeah. So, but at the same time, you know, this is the kind of guy he would like, oh, you're not going to school on Friday. Uh, we're going to go to the stockyards. You know, you're going to come with me and see, you know, where the cows, we raise cows. You're going to see where they go. Uh, we would go to a slaughterhouse and we'd just walk through the slaughterhouse and be like, oh, this is interesting. So to me, the biggest, one of the biggest lessons he got, he told me was like, he didn't even tell me this, but it was basically like the biggest lessons you'll learn are not in school. So that was one of the things. But then also, I, I think actually, to go back a little bit more, I mean, this guy worked so hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would work in the summertime. He would look like he was Jamaican because he was had been out in the sun all the time. And then in the wintertime, he would be out there, you know, 20 below, working bare hands because that's what he had to do. And his hand, he'd come in, his hands are all cracked from the cold. I think, you know, by the time he passed away, I think he was down to – two fingers on one side and you know four on the other you know it's just that's just how it operated so he was just a super hard worker and that was the biggest lesson from both of my parents was hard work so that's that's what I got from him yeah what's one thing uh that you wish people would ask you but somehow never gets asked like what, what's one thing that you Man, you want to talk about more but people never ask that question you know what I do love talking about my dad I do. I, um, you know, he passed away like over 10 years ago and I just love telling the stories because first of all, he was entertaining as heck. Um, and I think, I think, you know, most guys who had a decent relationship with their father like talking about their fathers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I talk about him a lot to, to Bedros and to my other friends and I, I guess, I guess that, but I mean, it's not, wasn't like I, it wasn't like he was this great dad who taught me all these amazing lessons. It was more like I learned what not to do mostly and sometimes that's a good like i i don't want to cut you off but i have to remind myself i don't have to do it perfect yeah i just have to be aware and and uh and humble with my kids so if i do make a mistake i don't want to like be prideful and not say i made a mistake because then they're going to think that's how it should be done yeah you yeah know? i mean so I don't, I don't have kids but you know i see a lot of my friends and like they get so guilt tripped about right. missing something, you know, missing a practice. Right. They got to be there. I'm like, I don't, you know, my dad didn't go to everything. Like, he went to a lot of my hockey games because he liked hockey, but he never went to my soccer games. I don't even know if he knew when my birthday was. And, but I, I don't, like, that doesn't bother me because I knew he was there and I knew that at any time at night I could find him up in his bedroom watching TV. And it was the consistency. So, to me, that's what I think good parenting about is about consistency and then, you know, just giving you enough room to go. Like, I played outside. Like, I'd be gone for nine hours. Mm -hmm. We lived on this farm, and they'd be like, well, just make sure you're back for, like, dinner. And, and then most of the time, like, uh, you know, we just saw Tom Bilyeu talk about how some lady let th their, their nine-year-old kid ride the subway. I mean, my parents made me bike three miles to baseball practice when I was eight. Like, right. it wasn't an option. Like, getting a ride was not an option. They were like, if you want to play baseball, you got to go bike. Find like a way on to make it on these on these dark country roads, you know. Right. And it's like, you know, so this is just that was those were all the lessons I learned growing up on the farm with 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 my father and uh, my mom. It's just work hard, and if you want something, you got to go and get it done yourself. It's so uh, this is a question that that I have for you because I feel my I mean my dad didn't have substance abuse issues and. Um, he was at all of my sporting events, but he was still similar to your dad, seemed very hardcore, very old school, um, you know, just drive, 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 get it done. Like, I feel like he attached his identity to how he provided for his family and how he presided over the home. Like, providing and presiding were very important to my dad, uh -huh. and I did feel loved. Um, did you with your, cause I, I, I love asking this question to people that have hardcore dads. Did you feel loved? Oh when yeah. You were I mean, a kid? 
Um, I mean, but he, your dad. Yeah, yeah. I know, I, mom did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally, totally. Uh, yeah, he would like. I, I really liked that he, he, he would. Um, you remember the little rascals? Do you remember that? Oh heck yeah! Yeah, he would call me. Uh, he would go, "My boy, buckwheat." Now I don't know why he would call me that, but that would he would he would call me that. So I, I uh, so he had that endearing term. Yeah, yeah, and you. I mean, man, we played, we played baseball in the backyard all the time. I mean, but he he would win. Like he it was, it, he was one of those dads where it's like, yeah, I'm gonna beat you. Yeah, you know, and and so baseball, we played hockey all the time together. So we spent a lot of time playing sports together. And he did go to all my hockey games and stuff. So I, I definitely felt that way, although there was just a lot of fighting. And, and he, you know, he definitely yelled at his kids way too much. Uh -huh. You know, it wasn't it wasn't right. Um, fortunately, like I like this is one of the things I'm most grateful for is like he never was physically abusive to anybody. But he was definitely emotionally abusive to sure. people in the family. But still, definitely still felt like in the end of the day, he was a, he wasn't a good guy, but he was a, a good enough dad, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, man. no that problem, was man. cool because I, you know, I meet you as like what you've become today. Like yeah. I literally, it's been 24 months that we've had a relationship. Sure. And so I always wonder like the influential people and then dude, I probably have a dozen of them in my life right now that I constantly go to for like advice or, you know, mentorship or just, you know, somebody to listen to what's going on for me. And I'm always curious what their home life was like because if I'm around all these influential, impactful, high achieving, highly conscious men, what were their fathers like? And what did their fathers do? Because I wanna be able to take the bits and the pieces of the amazing things that your dad did, and I wanna grow that inside myself. Yeah. So if I can grow that inside myself, maybe I'll see what makes you great inside of my son, yeah. inside of my four daughters. Yeah, and, and as we talk about it, I think one of the, the saddest things about him though was Again, you know Tom Billu, who we we talked, uh, just saw speak a couple uh, an hour ago, and and that's why it's fresh in my mind is that Tom Billu is driven by reaching his own personal potential, mm. and I see that. I mean, my father was a very intelligent person, but you know because of his demons that he had, you know his father probably had some um, mental health issues that got passed down to him, and but then he saw that in his father, and so he kind of neutered himself with alcohol and and he but he was such he had so much potential and didn't reach it mm -hmm. and i think that that i remember uh, is that know, a motivator for you no nah, it just makes me feel bad for him mm -hmm. you know uh, like you just look at it go like what could have been for this guy he, i mean he could have been a great husband he could have been probably a great businessman um and it just never came out and i think i saw a little bit of sadness in him in his final year when he he and I were just randomly talking about stuff and you could see that in him. It's like, Oh man, I, um, I don't think that's what drives me. I definitely want to reach my highest potential, but sure. I don't know. It's because of like, Oh, my dad didn't. I think it's just, I'm just internally driven to, to be my best self. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. Man. Yeah, no problem. Dude. Talking about family stuff is not, um, I mean, because you're so in service to other people, I, I would expect that rarely do people ask you, about that facet of your yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, not not hardly at all. Yeah. yeah. I'm really curious to that cuz I like the way you show up in service to other people. I'm very curious to like what helped foster and create that. Yeah, because you know, my mom's into volunteering in the the local fair, but I mean, it's not like you know, there's no entrepreneurial bones in the, sure. in the body or anything. So, uh what got me into this stuff I think actually this this is a story I've told once or twice before, but I think what got me into helping other people change was this really like kind of another sad moment when I was a kid, and I don't know if it is like an exact uh, you know factor in it, but maybe subconsciously. So, anyways, I'm driving home from the little city where we grew up near and the farm, which was just like a five minute drive. So Stratford, Ontario, Canada, and we're coming home in this big old green car and I'm sitting in the front seat, no seatbelt on, it's 1979, right? So, you know, you don't have to wear a seatbelt and kids can sit in the front seat. Sure. I'm four years old and I look over and my mom's really kind of sad and I go, mom, why sad? And she goes, well, I was just at Weight Watchers and I didn't lose any weight. And I think that because I think, I don't know for sure, but I think like maybe subconsciously because I was, you know, that really hurt me as a little boy and I was like, I don't want to see mommy sad. I'm like, okay, I don't like it when people disappoint other people, like they go for help and they don't get serviced. And then as I, when I was in my teenage years, I would just get pissed off when I'd like see these people trying to lose weight and they were doing all these stupid things. Like, it's not that 
freaking hard. It's so simple. Just do this, or even with when I got into like business coaching, it comes down to discipline, though. But you, you, you were disciplined, and so the frustration was these people want this, but, but they're not willing to exchange. They're willing. They're willing to go on a one week to... cabbage soup diet right. and lose three pounds, and then for the next fifty one weeks of the year, go back to normal and and right. end up gaining ten pounds. It's like that's not how you do it, and then it's not you know same with business like. I'm going to go and, you know, put all my money into like some buying branding, a branding ad. But that's not how you do it. You know, don't go and do one stupid thing. Just be pretty good for 52 weeks instead of once trying to like hit a lottery ticket. You I, know? I, I live my life 80, 20. So, and it's funny, like we'll have breakfast out here during the speakers. And it's funny because everybody will like giggle at the amount of food that I'm eating or like right. what I'm eating. Like, Oh my gosh, you eat that much yeah. bacon. Or when we go to the steakhouse last night and you know, like I eat a lot more food than a normal person. And sometimes I eat a lot of things that people wouldn't assume that I eat because I'm in elite shape, but I live the 80, 20 rule. So like when I'm at home, I'm living a hundred percent clean for the most part. And that budgets me the allowance to when I go on a trip, I can just eat out of convenience and like what I want to eat. Yeah. Because the last thing you want to do when you're traveling all the time is like having really strict parameters or for what you should eat. So it's just like the advice that you're giving is literally how I live my life as I eat clean nearly 100% of the time when I'm at home if I have travel built into my schedule. Now, if I don't have travel built into my schedule, I'm going 80 20 at the house. That's yeah, yeah. easy for me to do because yeah. I get to prepare my meals or I get to to select what I order based upon what I want, not like what's nearest to my hotel room. Right. Um, how, how has life on the road um, proposed difficulties with anxiety, um, with overwhelm, with depression? Because for me, sleep and routine are my keys. If I have those two things, then I feel like I can, I can for the most part, be the master of my destiny. But I need those two things, and I have trouble um, sleeping and have trouble with my routine when I'm traveling. Well, I, w I bet you didn't have that much travel uh, trouble with routine while you were traveling when you were playing, though. No, because my whole my whole life, like, you have five minutes for a bathroom break once yeah. you get to Seattle, and then we'll have a team meeting for 57 minutes, and then coach will have a three-minute team meeting, right. then we'll have team meal, and then lights out at 11, and then you play the Seattle Seahawks, and then at 3.55, you'll be on the plane. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. my whole life was mapped out for me. So part of my overwhelm and – and the, the strength of my overwhelm, uh, anxiety, depression has grown since retiring is because I don't have a coach. Right. I don't have a parent setting expectation levels the way a coach does. This is our goal. You know, this, these are the expectations. I'm goal oriented, but I, I pick the goal and then I'm not good at the steps, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G on the way to get to the goal. And it can be overwhelming because the goals that I set for myself, Craig, as you know, you've coached me, yeah. are freaking huge, huge. Yeah, yeah. They're not million dollar ideas. They're they're billion dollar ideas, but that that can cause some overwhelm when you want to have a global impact and just dis totally disrupt markets the way that I do. But I don't I didn't have that coach to set out my itinerary the same way that I kind of described to you. That's like the the time allotments that I was rattling off, those were real. Like yeah. three minutes for this, three minutes for that. And it was like like clockwork and I became a master of execution because things were mapped out for me. Yeah. Now as an entrepreneur, that's where I needed to reach out to you so you could teach me how to write out my own itinerary, mm -hmm. you know, my own to-do list, my own goal pursuit checklist. Yeah, so I look at it, the, I came up with the phrase after listening to Bedros talk about all these Navy SEAL books that he reads. So mm -hmm. I, when I travel, I'm an operator. You know, I have, I have my backpack. I know what's in every side pocket. Here's the protein bar. Here's the, the nuts. You know, here's the, the greens powder. And so I, you know, I look at it like I'm dropped in on a mission and I'm going to go, I'm going to do uh, this. That's good. Like I, I time myself as to how quickly I get out of the airport and through customs when I get back into Toronto. Yeah. And I'm always racing to see if I yeah. can improve my time. Your relationship with time is extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's inspiring. Because it's, there's so much I want to do. Sometimes I, I feel like, Craig, dude, like there's five people at the table. You don't have to time yourself and talk to each one of them for five minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but, it's, but it's great. And, and, but it, also, it is inspiring, though. But it's also helpful because people are going, I don't want to be like that. But here's the thing. 
anybody who's, I'm a free flower, dude. Well, yeah, that's that's, that's cool. <laughs> I'm a and, hugger. I, I'm a lover. But but if somebody travels a lot, you know, whether it's for work or holiday or whatever it is, I bet they go on a trip and they get way off their routine and they go home and they get sick. And oh, so, I get sick almost every right. after every, and, almost, and every so, trip. So I get a lot of I work with my entrepreneur clients and I hear that all the time. I go, you got to become an operator just like me. Mm-hmm. And I mean. I I That's take wa- I take right washing now. my hands seriously when I travel, and, and it's like, hey, listen, I know you're going to an, an event, and I know in the past when you went to that event, you would get drunk and you know would stay out late. You can still go out, just don't get drunk. Don't eat, you know, like our friend Joel who ate two desserts last night. Dude, did he get ever get after it? Yeah, and and but that was like a giant dessert. We were there for an extra half an hour just because just he to was, let him finish his sorbet right, and his key lime pie. Right, right, and and but listen, just because. And you, I'm sure you see this all the time too. You go in an airport and you see a normal person. As soon as they walk into an airport, they think it's like, oh, I can eat anything I want in here. Calories don't count in the airport. Right. Right? Or at 30,000 feet. I heard that. Right. Was that a Harvard study? Right. No, right. it was MIT. Right. And it's like, what? You would never eat an Annie Ann's pretzel or whatever it is like anywhere else, but you're eating it here in the airport and you look tired and you look like you're feel, feeling terrible. Don't be like that. So when you go in the airport, you got your snacks. You get, you know, you can eat healthy. Comes in down air- to planning, though, yeah, and prepping. Yeah. And, but but it's that mindset. Like, hey, listen, you're gonna go to this ah, event. Good. I'm you're- gonna start doing that because I did that when I played. Right. I did that when I played, and I got away from it. And the reason I got away from it is my schedule wasn't airtight like that. Yeah. And so when my schedule is not airtight like that, my mindset is not airtight like that. Right. And so it is just a mindset thing. And so again, for the people listening. Your most important thing is probably your family, your home life. And if you go and screw it up on the road and you come back and you're sick for a week when you get home and you, you know, somebody else in the family gets sick, how many times are you going to let that happen before you like grow up Mm -hmm. and go, you know what, just because I'm on a work trip doesn't mean I'm allowed to eat at Cheesecake Factory three times and, you know, eat junk in the airport. And so... Listen, I've traveled a lot. I do over 100,000 miles you every year. you travel more than anybody I know. Yeah, and I, you know, I've been to 50 countries, and, and I mean, I love going and traveling to different countries and seeing how they operate. But I also, I, I go prepared. Just like if you were, if, like if you dropped me off in Afghanistan with a backpack on, like a, and a Navy SEAL, I'm an operator. I've got my mission. I know how I'm going to operate here. I'm going to have a good time, you know, interacting with people. But I don't need to go overboard on all the junk that's going to get me off track physically. So what was the – conversely, there's the operator and there's the uh, – I know it's a non-operator. I don't know if there was a – like a, Well, a civilian. You know, yeah. it's like, but yeah, it don't be like, a freaking civilian. Yeah. Be oper- I'm moving forward out of this podcast an operator. And I am in a lot of facets of my life. Be an operator. But I, I, I allow myself when I travel now because I think I – th- and this is maybe a subconscious thing. Is like when I would fly – in the off season and it wasn't team related to me that was a vacation because i never did that i never fly anywhere unless it's a vacation when i'm like with the kids and everything so i allow i associate getting on a plane now to not work and nine times out of ten when i'm flying it's for work at least eight out of ten times i'm flying it's for work but because it's not like uh nfl work right i'm not viewing it with the same operator mindset dude so i'm gonna be able to level up after this podcast this was good man yeah because this you know really good and i travel a lot this to is go gonna and, be helpful for me i travel a lot to go and speak and i can't you know show up after eating junk on an airplane and you're eating airplane food and if you're eating dessert on an airplane like you're just wasting calories you know it's right. like save them for a nice restaurant or something right right you know, go in i've done a good job of that yeah. But Good. like I'm, I'm traveling right now. Like we're in Chino Hills. I'm only an hour and a half from my this house. Is, how can this even count as traveling? You're an hour and a half away I'm from staying home in, in the hotel. same state. Yeah, but I'm like I'm eating. I'm staying in a hotel. Like I'm, I'm not in my office. Right. I don't have a, ref, you know, I don't have my refrigerator. Was it my fault? It's my for, excuse. Was it my that's fault ex- for ordering the, uh, the wagyu last night? Like you, oh no, I uh, no, remember dude, you I was were all like, over that. you were like, wait a minute, I'm gonna do this more often because you yeah. were skeptical of me at first. And yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah. Yeah. That was judgment. That was a judgment. That's conversation all right, dude. I had to have that's myself. all right. All right, so I got two more questions for you. Cool, um, dude. This is really helpful. Like, Good, man. This, especially that operator for me, man. That hits home for me because um, I'm completely in control of that. And we I've been, all are. I've been, yeah, and I've been, because I know I've done it before. Yes. But now I'm, I'm becoming a little frustrated with myself because when I do return back from those three and four day trips, when I go speak or do TV shows or go to create content or whatever it is that that my life holds for me, or it might be in service to a charity or something like that, speaking in New York, 
I always come home worse than when I left. Yeah. And so my motivation is to be efficient and productive while I'm on that trip, but not so busy that I come home sick, I come home tired, and I, I just bring like negative energy back into like the championship culture that I left. Yeah. I leave and it's a championship locker room, and then I come back and like I'm the one that brings the negative juju. Like yeah. I'm grumpy because I'm tired, or like I can't help with the kids because I'm sick. And that's an our area of my life where I feel like um, I get to prove to myself that I'm capable of returning back to the house as good or better in addition to getting everything done that I have planned while I was out and doing it and not and staying accountable to my values of taking care of myself and still allowing myself a minimum of two hours a day for self-care if that's you know yoga or that's lifting weights or that's meditation or that's reading a book things that serve me and me only those are those are the things I want to stay accountable to I'm always going to get my lift in yeah. but like what what other wellness are you doing for like your brain and for your intention for the day and that's just that tip of just the mindset of operating right you know, being an operator you, you just need to look at tr at getting on an airplane as no different than going in a car and driving down the street yeah, to your office it's mindset yeah. that's good man all right the second to last question is what is one thing nobody knows about you uh, man um I tell a lot of stuff about myself Craig, on Craig, the internet. Craig, this is a safe place. These are good people listening to this. If you share something you've never shared before, I promise you if you do, it will relate people to you. All right. Well, I've been I've been more vulnerable on this show than I've been anywhere else in my life. I've talked about, you know, sexual abuse, addictions, like gambling addictions, yeah. you know, just you name it. If it brings like excitement to people i've been addicted to it yeah you know so so i'll say this so again goes back to the tom bill you thing and he he was talking about how when he was interviewing people sometimes he asked people you know there's there's a genie they're going to give you one wish you could ask for anything and my answer in my head was i want a time machine to go back and right so many wrongs and treat people so much better and you know like there's definitely like two relationships i have with girls where i was like man i can't believe i treated them so poorly mm -hmm. and, and you know they're in a great place now they're they're happily married to people and they got kids and everything but it's like i just didn't need to treat them the way that i did so sure. I, I would just go back like i guess i'm a kind of like a regretful person i'm just go back and like i just want to live my life again and not be such a dick that's one thing that so that would be your wish that would be my wish yeah dude, not for a billion we gotta work on that man not we gotta work on that not for a billion dollars dude just what to... how about i'm gonna uh, dude i want to coach you on this for a minute so what if you had that one dream what if your what if your dream was or your wish was being able to become the person that's going to find an even better relationship with that and a better person that's able to go back to that those two women and make it right. Well, cuz then you're moving forward and you're like the master of your destiny. Well, I am going to become that person, so it's not that's Oh, you're doing it every day. Yeah. And, and I don't I don't like think I'm not saying like with those girls I'm like, "Oh man, I missed out." Like they weren't the right girls for me. So, I'm not like regretting right. no, that yeah, either. Yeah. But no, but, you're, you're talking about humanity. Yeah, you know, you're talking about like the way that you treated a person, not just yeah. a girl. I get yeah. it. I and I am totally like my theme for this year is become, I love that though. be the man I need to be, to, to be. So I'm, I'm glad I'm, that we I'm, did this yeah. because I got to see another side of because these are not questions and conversations that you and I usually have. It's usually mm -hmm. like results oriented. Sure. Um, and so it's it's been fun to ask you questions yeah. like this because you're on a podcast and you kind of have to answer them. Sure. And you don't get to think about them, and I and I like that. Yeah. Last question. What is your legacy? What would people remember Craig Ballantyne for? Uh, helping 100 million people transform their lives physically, financially, mentally, and emotionally. So, you know, I've written, I, and I'm probably doing it mostly through books. You know, I've got the perfect day formula. I did a lot of stuff in the fitness space before, but didn't feel like that was big enough for me. And then, you know, the new book here is The Unstoppable One. I'm going to write another one this year called Perfect Week Formula. Mm -hmm. And then the one after that one is going to be The Operator Mindset. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, um, I've only written, I've only um, read one of his books, and it was unstoppable. Yeah. Um, and you have several others that 
you know, I get to make the time in my schedule to actually sit down and read them. Well, you've gone um, through the but, enti- but uh, that's entire I, day with me. So. Yeah, that's what I was alluding to is like I've benefited from so many of the things that you've created because I did the perfect. And I wanted to share with everybody because I was kind of referencing how you've coached me, but you coached me. We had a, a, it's a private client. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the exact title of it? That the perfect perfect day workshop yeah that's what it was called down. we're changing the the names of it and stuff but it was right. it was perfect life workshop that you and i did one-on-one version i do small group versions but right you know with the high-end clients i do one-on-one versions yeah dude so i i encourage people to go um to amazon unstoppable craig ballantyne take a look at that book and and decide from yourself if if a perfect day workshop either in a group setting or whatever and this is not me pushing your products like i've done it like i want to speak from experience i want to i want to endorse not just the workshop but the person that created and is running the workshop man dude you're you're doing really powerful things in a lot of powerful people's lives and that's allowing those powerful people to also impact people on a greater level because you're allowing me the time in my schedule and the time in my life because I have a better relationship with time, you allowed me to launch a podcast. Right. Like, think about that for a minute and think about all the other people that you've helped them get out of their own way. Um, so it's just awesome, man. Thank and you, dude. I, you and should really love what you do because you do make a difference in people's lives. You've made a difference in my life, my marriage, um, you know, my entrepreneurial leadership and my relationship with time, which benefits all of those things. So where can people go on social media if they want to connect with you or consume more of your content? What is your website? Where can people get more Craig Ballantyne? Awesome. So first of all, not only get the book, but get the audio book. I am so proud Ooh, of the audio. I didn't audio- know that. I am so That's proud of, of the audio book for Unstoppable because I do like a really great bunch of voices in it and, and great so pitch. So you did it and- yourself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, it's it's That's awesome. Cool, man. So the audiobook is really great. Uh, Real Craig Ballantyne on Instagram, and then CraigBallantyne.com if you want to send me a message. Dude, thank you so much, man. I I appreciate you sharing some of the things that you've never shared before. Um, it's and, hard when you like share a lot of stuff on social yeah. media. It's not though, dude. Nobody shares more than I do, and like I'll get into conversations with friends like you know like Joel Marion or Lewis House, and we'll be on a podcast, and they'll say something that just completely almost like unlocks a part of my brain that let a story come out because they they said something that you know because that's why i think that's what i want to become is is a podcast host that not just comes on there and talks about the different stuff that they've done and when the guests share something me be like oh yeah me too and you know just like constantly bringing myself up because i do like fight that always about me conversation that's a comfortable place for me to be is to talk about myself Mm -hmm. so to grow into the type of person that can make the platform all about the guest that's on is something that i i want to grow into but i think the best podcast hosts make it all about the guest so that's what i'm trying to to evolve into dude thank you for being a part of my journey craig ballantyne.com real craig ballantyne on instagram if you enjoyed this segment um Please subscribe Subscribe to the show if you haven't done it already. Um, Craig Ballantyne's book is at craigballantyne.com, and it's also on Amazon. And if this was helpful for you in understanding a little bit more about anxiety or depression or overwhelm, um, and you think it would be helpful to somebody in your life, share this episode with them. Um, we appreciate you guys. This is Steve Weatherford Show. Craig Ballantyne, we're out.